Hello everybody, welcome to the North Shore Writers Festival. My name is Tara Matsuzaki and I'm a librarian here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. The North Shore Writers Festival is brought to you by all three North Shore Writers, li pardon me, North Shore <laughs> Library System, uh, North Vancouver City, North Vancouver District, and West Vancouver Memorial. The festival is supported by the Friends of the Library Groups of all three libraries and sponsored by the North Shore News. We would also like to thank our fantastic official festival bookseller, Black Bond Books, <coughs> sitting at the back. Um, and now it's my pleasure to welcome you to our opening event, John Valiant and Grant Lawrence in Conversation. John Valiant is one of Canada's most acclaimed literary journalists. He has gained a reputation for writing best-selling and multi-award winning nonfiction with ecological, social, and historical themes, beginning with The Golden Spruce and then followed by The Tiger. John Valiant's newest book is his debut work of fiction. The Jaguar's Children has overwhelmingly been met with international praise. Grant Lawrence is a musician, veteran radio broadcaster, and CBC radio personality. When Grant tried his hand at writing, he authored two best-selling and award-winning memoirs, Adventures in Solitude and The Lonely End of the Ring. Please join me in welcoming John Valiant and Grant Lawrence. for being here. Thanks for skipping the Canucks game. <laughs> yes. Can you hear us, John? Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Uh, it's great. This is, this is my hometown library. This is the library that I grew up with. I spent many years staring out that, this used to be the children's section down here, uh, and I spent many years staring out that window into the fern gully, reading my Tin Tin books, and uh, it's, it's great to be back, and great to be back with such an acclaimed, international, best-selling author. Another hand for John <laughs> So, uh, welcome to West Vancouver. This is uh, also, not only is it my hometown, but it is also, if you've uh, read The Golden Spruce, John's first book, which came out 10 years ago, uh, it is also the hometown of, I suppose it's the anti-hero of the book, <laughs> antagonist, I don't know if that's the right word, of Grant Hadwin. And so this is the man that is intricately connected uh, with the golden spruce in the worst ways. So, um, and I know the book is mostly set in the coastal wilderness, Haida Gwaii, but did you ever actually come to West Van to uh, research Grant's uh, childhood? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, and it's really thanks to the people of West Van that I really came to understand him better. He was, there are probably people here who knew the Hadwin's family, I'm guessing. Uh, and one of your number, um, who may have passed, he was 92 when I finally found him, but uh, there's a fellow up the hill, uh, and he was the one who had taught Grant tennis at a tennis club back in the 60s, and that was the only way, that was my only way into figuring out who the family was, because everyone had passed away. And there he had no relatives with the last name Hadwin. And in desperation, I call it. I knew he played tennis, and I knew he was from the Lower Mainland. And his brother had changed his name, so I went, when I went to the high school to look for him, there was no, his brother wasn't there. And, when, and he had uh, quit in his junior year, so he wasn't there among the graduating class. So it was a mystery until I, I knew he played tennis. So I called every tennis club in the Lower Mainland to find him there was somebody else. In up the hill, who uh, remembered it, and then he knew the entire family and connected me to uh, the dear Barbara Johnson, who was his aunt, but of course had a different name. And uh, she, she really understood a lot of the dynamics that helped me understand him. So West Van Roots, yeah. 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 who knew? Yeah. Uh, so, it, as I mentioned, it's been 10 years, and we're going to get to uh, the Jaguar's children in a minute, but I just want to do a bit of a recap of the, the whole career. Uh, it, as I mentioned, a decade since the publication of The Golden Spruce, and I just want to do kind of a catch-up 
what is there now uh, at the site of, uh, of the spruce? Well, there is a, a giant nurse log. You know, the, that, the golden spruce is now nurturing thousands of young trees that probably, I haven't been up there in a few years, but they're probably a pretty good size now because a lot happens in the rainforest in 10 years, as you know. And there was, there are a number of seedlings, a number of cuttings, scions, uh, taken from the golden spruce starting in 68 by Oscar Z. Clyde from UBC, but successive generations. And one of those was planted uh, at the site, and I believe it didn't survive. There's another one under heavy guard, you know, kind of like this white rhinoceros uh, in Port Clements, you know, behind 10-foot fence. I think that one struggles on. But the, the good news uh, of sorts is that it has been, it's kind of a, it's a, been a fascination for many um, botanists and amateur uh, tree enthusiasts. And so it's uh, little scions are growing in greenhouses and nurseries really all over the world at this point, all yeah. over the temperate world. Are any of them showing the genetic oh, yeah. mutation and the, the oh, yeah. golden? Oh, they are? Absolutely. E yeah. Even the ones that are coming out of the nurse log? No, those ones, see, those would be seedlings from other trees. I see. So there's that, that golden spruce, that one in particular, is finished, you know, and so it's only the cuttings, which have been scattered, you know, literally to the four winds at this point, are, are still, you know, carrying on that, that trait. Right. So the, in, in a way, it's the tree's descendants. Yeah, I mean, how I think of it is kind of a, a single light that shattered, and now little tiny fragments and shards of it are, are all over the place. You know, it's in botanical gardens around the world at this point. So, and and uh, no word on Grant Hadwin. He's he's a cipher. Yeah, nothing. No one's told me anything. Uh, so. So uh, let's move on uh, to the next book, The Tiger, uh, which is your second uh, work of nonfiction. Another huge international success, another book about man versus nature. Uh, this case, instead of a tree, uh, it is a Siberian man-eater, uh, which I believe there's a line in the book where, and you know, I'm going to quote you and I'll probably misquote you slightly, but uh, a creature with the agility of a house cat and the mass of a industrial refrigerator? <laughs> okay. Let's go with that one there. Okay. Is, that, yeah. is that in there? Yeah. Or is yeah. that, okay. uh, something like okay. that. Okay, all right. So uh, I want to ask what's the latest on uh, the tiger because I have read and heard about a film. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Brad Pitt's film company, Plan B, did option it. They renewed their option, which is their way, Hollywood's way of showing interest, and or continued interest. And it's been through, started out with um, Aronofsky, and um, uh, Guillermo, Arriaga, uh, Guillermo Arriaga was going to be the script writer. He's the guy who wrote uh, 26 Grams and Babel. So you'd think, you know, what an incredible team, but. Uh, Plan B didn't like his script terribly, so it's been through a few other iterations. They had a new script writer, Aronofsky went away, he did Wolverine, he did Noah, he had some uh, other adventures and now he's back on it, apparently. But honestly, I'm really the last to know. <laughs> so I don't know what's happening right now. But the fact that it's lived this long in Hollywood's consciousness and that they've tried this many times to make it is an indication of seriousness. So, and it's only, it hasn't been that, I mean, it's only been a few years. Yeah, I mean, I think a few years in West Van is very different from a few years in West Van. You're all great. Yeah. Uh, West Van Kuhre is not a stretch. Yeah, the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, and uh, I also wanted to, uh, just on the subject of films, there is a Golden Spruce film. Correct. Yeah, yeah, there is. And it's premiering at Hot Docs next week in Toronto. And it's called Hadwin's Judgment. And it is was made for <coughs> seven years to make it uh, by Sasha Snow, who is the fellow who made uh, the film Conflict Tiger, which I saw in Banff, which inspired me to write the tiger. 
And we became good friends through that process. And one of the things that I sent him to kind of demonstrate my, my seriousness of purpose, if you will, was a copy of the Golden Spruce. And both of us were between projects at that point. And he read it in a couple of weeks and called me back. And this is back in 2007. And he said, you know, uh, how would you feel if I made a film about your book, since you're making a book about my film? And, and I said, fine. And, and this has actually happened now. And I, I, I think this might be a first in terms of different you know, people working in different media, trading their stories across media so symmetrically. And so this documentary is just about to launch. And um, it's uh, very excited to see it. I'm, I'm in it as a talking head, but I have not seen the whole thing, so I'll be there at the premiere on the 27th in Toronto, and I'm really curious to see what the other 119 minutes looks like. Well, hopefully so, we'll see it at one of our uh, film fests out here. I suspect it will come west. I hope so. so. Uh, so that brings us to uh, your third and current book, which is why you're here tonight. The Jaguar's Children, and uh, the, what differentiates this book. There are similar themes in all three books, but what really differentiates this one is that it is a work of fiction. So the question, of course, is you are a very successful nonfiction writer. You're very much acclaimed, award-winning. You could probably write nonfiction for the rest of your days. What compelled you to make the leap to fiction? A few different things. I, <laughs> I remember uh, when I first got into this with the Golden Spruce and you, if, they, if you, um, uh, as a nonfiction writer, if you were lucky enough to win a prize, there, you might get your name in there, there might be a little picture. But the fiction writers always had really big pictures. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think I always felt as a, a nonfiction writer a little bit like a, a literary stepchild. So and, kind of looking uh, across the room at the fiction writers. You know, and there's this glow that <laughs> uh, follows them around. And, uh, and now I know why. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's hard to do. And uh, so I think, no, I, seriously, I do think in, in the lurking inside a lot of nonfiction writers is a novelist dying to get out. And uh, so that was something, it was a, a dream to do it. And also I do see it you know, in terms of long form uh, prose, it's the supreme challenge. And you know, one friend of mine described nonfiction as building houses and fiction as building boats. And in West Van, we, you know, we know the difference. And uh, <laughs> building boats is harder. Uh, and so in a lot of ways, I think the nonfiction was, for me, a kind of a training, an apprenticeship. You know, and I, uh, which isn't to say I don't love nonfiction. It's kind of the, for me, it's probably my favorite medium. But in terms of this particular story, the Jaguar's children, and the different uh, forces that were feeding into it, the tributaries, one, the fact that we were living in southern Mexico at the time and just seeing so many different things, it was sort of almost too much to, for, I couldn't see a way to corral it all into nonfiction. And then there's also this um, family history piece, uh, and if those of you who've read the book, there's an archaeologist in there who's modeled on my grandfather, who was a prominent archaeologist in Mexico back in the 20s and 30s and 40s. And so there's a lot of family history in the country. And um, so dealing with that also. And so really it's, and you get this, I think there's just, uh, they're different sized containers. Um, and poems are beautiful containers. Songs are beautiful containers. Nonfiction book. And for me, for, the, for everything I was seeing and learning and feeling about Mexico and you know, Mexico has really been a part of my life since I was born, just because of the family history there and the way people talked about it and felt about it. Uh, the novel was really the only container that was big enough to hold everything that I wanted to put in there. Well, let's back up a bit, just because it's a relatively new book. Uh, this book is, is uh, from the perspective, your, your narrator is a, a Mexican young man mm -hmm. who uh, is attempting 
an illegal border crossing under brutal circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and maybe we could get into that a little bit because this is the opening scene and it's not a spoiler, uh, but what drew you and what, what, uh, what I, I suppose the question would be, what drew you to that specific subject and those circumstances? And, and that's really the, the other, the kind of the, the magic of the novel and, and, and why good novelists do have that glow around them is um, there's where that opening scene comes from, this fellow who's you know, texting this distress call from inside uh, the tank of a water truck in which he is sealed uh, and has been abandoned. Um, that really came to me out of the ether. I was working on the Tiger when we were living in Mexico in 2009 and 10, so I was, I was physically in Mexico, but my head was still in the Russian Far East and dealing with you know, big cats. And so Mexico was kind of creeping in almost unconsciously, and at one point after about five or six months there, I was sitting at my computer and the opening lines of the book just came to me, which are, I'm sorry to bother you, but I need some assistance. And I'm a nonfiction guy and I, I get my quotes from live sources or from reliable documents. You know, I don't get them out of the ether, generally. But this scene came through so clear, the voice was so strong, the, the, I knew exactly where he was. He was inside the tank of this truck. He was on the U.S. Mexican border, he was in deep distress, he was calling for help, and I can't really explain where that those of you who um, you know, work in the arts, and, and, and I think it happens in, in, in other professions too, you get inspirations, and it's not always clear where that comes from, and I've tried to reconstruct the source, I saw lots of water trucks driving around in Oaxaca where we were living. I wondered about their efficacy as devices for smuggling people. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the U.S.-Mexican border as a younger man, exploring around. And one in three Oaxacanos at some point goes up to the States to work, many of them illegally. So these were all bits and pieces of information, but what sparked that, I really can't explain. And, uh, but it was so strong, it felt, um, you know, there's that, uh, that notion in improvisational theater where you never turn down an offer. You know, so if you're on stage and somebody says, here's a light bulb, you don't say, actually, it's a milk cart. You say, let's screw it in and see what happens. And, and I, I feel that, too, about the muse when you get an idea that comes in, especially as strong as that one did. I owed it the, the courtesy, really, to, to explore it, see where it went. And this is where it went. And, and so uh, the situation is, is that uh, your narrator, Hector, the young Mexican man, uh, is in this truck, which is sealed from the outside. And can you just explain the circumstances of how he ends up in the truck with these people? Yeah. Uh, this this all takes place in 2007, following a, you know, it's all based on real events. You know, pretty much everything in the book I saw myself or heard firsthand, and. Um, there had been just this very destructive uh, strike in, in Oaxaca that had, in some ways, had done a lot of social and physical damage to the city. And this young man, who had wanted to stay and make a go of it, um, was forced by you know, various circumstances to, to consider leaving. And then he meets an old school friend under accidental circumstances, and this guy is actually running for the border. And Hector's father has been hassling him about leaving. His, his father's in despair about uh, the state of Mexico. He's tried to uh, emigrate before and been deported. And so he's saying, you know, you're young, you're strong, you should go. You know, that's where the future is. And Hector has really been holding out uh, until he runs into this friend of his, Caesar, and they go together. And it's Caesar's idea to go in the truck, which is a faster route instead of walking, which is a two or three day ordeal across the Sonoran Desert, very, very dangerous, very high failure rate, high mortality rate. Known as a death march to, to Well, yeah, for many, for many it is. And you know, the, the, the mortality rate is roughly 500 known deaths a year in the American desert. And it's uh, you know, really a shocking statistic when you think about it. And Caesar's thinking is, well, we'll go in this truck. We'll pay more, but we'll get across in three hours. But 
the whole human smuggling business has changed enormously because drug cartels have taken, taken over. And it didn't used to be that way, and it used to be a much more normal procedure for people from Oaxaca, from southern Mexico. They would get smuggled across by a coyote. They would do three months in the fields in the States, and they'd come back. And it was a routine. It was a, it was a kind of migratory round, and it benefited everybody. And, but you know, over the past 10, 15 years, drug cartels have taken over the south side of the border, and now it's much more mercenary, much more um, vicious and there's much less concern about actually getting people across safely. They're interested in money. In and, and once they go, they're, if they do make it across, they're there pretty much, they, they can't do the migratory path. Because there there's a 23,000 man and woman border army on the U.S. side now, which is, you know, that's all different. So once people actually, if you make it across safely, you're much less likely to try to come back, uh, even when, when the work cycle is over. Uh, so people stay. And that's not really what people necessarily want to do. People want to come up and work and return to their families. And now the families are more permanently broken. And you have kids and spouses trying to get across too. And it's very disruptive. So, now you mentioned a few times that you were in Mexico. I mean, you live here in Vancouver with your family. Maybe you could explain the circumstances of, of why you were in Mexico, where you were in Mexico. Yeah. I. It was deep into the tiger, 2000, starting after, after 2007, 2008, you know, I was over in Russia a couple of times, writing the book. Uh, 2009, I think my wife, who's a pottery anthropologist, was feeling, you know, I more or less lost my husband to a large furry animal, and I would like to, you know, spice things up a bit. And, um, you know, I think she, uh, given the options available to her, I think she chose a really uh, sustainable, um, option, which was to move the entire family to southern Mexico, and you know, large undertaking, as any of you have, who have expatriated uh, can attest. And we had small kids, and she wanted to go work with indigenous potters in Mexico. And, and in Oaxaca, it's it's uh, there are 16 different tribes down there, 16 different languages spoken from infancy to uh, elderhood, and cultures are largely intact. A hundred dialects among those. Uh, people are making pots down there the way they did a thousand years ago. It's a very interesting place to go if you're an artist, if you're an anthropologist. So for Nora, it was uh, a dream come true. And I was just writing so I could carry suitcases and, and we went down there. Uh, and I was, we'd go together, you know, into these communities and, and you'd meet grandma and grandma didn't speak a word of Spanish. You know, despite 500 years of conquest, she had kind of dodged that. And then you'd meet the, the kids, uh, and they would be bilingual. Sometimes they might have English because they would have been up to the States. And then you'd meet the very young people, people like Hector, 15 to 22. And not only would they have, you know, perfect Zapotec, say, perfect Spanish, they'd know some English, but they would also be completely literate in digital communication. And because people completely, you know, skip the landline and went straight to cell phones. So everybody's got a cell phone down there. And so they're mediating really a thousand years of technological history. I think it was kind of like, you know, where the Inuit were maybe back in the 80s. And uh, it's, it, psychically, that's, you know, a, a very difficult thing to do. And um, what's going to happen over the next 20 years and is anybody's guess. But I, could, I realized once we were down there and I saw this with my own eyes that you know, we're in a moment now. This is a historic <coughs> moment for this part of the world. And I you know, was compelled somehow to try to, to explore it, capture it, um, and give it its due. Because you know, what's going on down there is uh, there's this whole core. I mean, there, there's so many, you know, there are lots of pieces that maybe the course of well uh, I mean this the, the thing is is that this book uh, I mean <coughs> it's not from your perspective it's from the perspective of Hector but uh, there's a lot of indigenous slang there's a lot of Spanish there is an incredible amount of what feels like deep knowledge into the culture how were you able to tap into that how, 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 how did you get in there I mean you, you are a gringo I am a gringo, yeah. It's very hard to mask that. 
Um, uh, one of the things that I have to say amazed me going down there was many of these folks, everyone would assume I was American. I'm a, I am a dual citizen. Uh, but they would assume down there I was American. And many of people they know, if not they themselves personally, have had difficult times on the border. And even if they've gotten across, there are all kinds of small and not so small humiliations and indignities that you suffer. In that pro and as a small brown person in the United States, there's a, just a lot of um, unpleasantness that can befall you, <coughs> either in a physical sense, but also just in the interpersonal. And so given that, and given uh, the history of US-Mexican relations, I was amazed over and over again at how warmly we were received. That it, it really felt like we were judged on our own merits. And that's really not the courtesy that most Mexicans get in, in the States. And so the fact that we were seen, my wife was seen, our kids were seen just as you know, you're down here, you're interested in, in our lives and what we do, welcome. You know, I saw the inside of a lot of people's homes. And how many Mexicans have been into my house, you know? And uh, so that was very moving to me and really kind of a lesson, frankly. And, and another thing that really struck me was, uh, and I think it may be a Zapotec thing, but people don't generally yell in anger. They might yell in a if they're selling something, they might yell in a fiesta situation, but they don't shout in anger. They don't bellow across spaces. And so the only people I, you know, we were around police and, you know, a lot of some difficult situations. And the only people I heard yell the whole time we were there, 10 months, was myself and my son. <laughs> and and you know, I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's normal up here, you know, for people to yell. And, uh, but down there, people really dealt with things in a different way. There was just a kind of cool and social grace that was very inspiring to me. And I'm trying to, to manifest it up here. But there's also this, you know, how do you get in? There's this, um, there's uh, this, I don't know if it's an affliction or a blessing, really, but it's, uh, there's this thing called mirror touch synesthesia. And you've know, heard about people who, who smell colors or, or um, you know, hear numbers and things like that. Well, there are people for whom their experience of walking in, they can walk into a room and someone over there could slap someone else on the back and they would feel it across the room, you know, at, at the nervous level. Or they'd walk into a room where there was a party going on and, you know, they might have no chemistry besides their own organic chemistry inside them, but people might be high or drunk and they would instantly get a buzz walking in. And I do think, and I wonder if this is true for you too, or you know, for other writers, uh, perceivers, you, there, there are fewer barriers somehow. And I do feel like things sort of come into me in a less defended way. And that's something that, you know, I sort of made my profession being an outsider, but an outsider who's very porous. So I walk into a situation, and it just starts to kind of come in. And that's not to say that there isn't, you know, first degree premeditated research going on, but there's also just a lot of sensory stuff that is just kind of coming through and I'm just noticing and, and just, and I'm curious. I mean, there's something that's just curiosity, but there's also just, I think, uh, an undefendedness. Yeah, helps. I think those are traits of the artist as well. Observe, absorb, mm -hmm. and put it back up. Yeah. And reflect. Yeah, yeah and reflect. And, and so, uh, I want to ask you about a specific scene in this book that is uh, very striking. And uh, as um, Hector is is stuck in this water truck, the coyotes have, have taken off, and he's in a state of, of purgatory, uh, and, and he's using a digital device uh, yeah. to, to try to communicate it. And he eventually uh, gets into almost a somewhat, uh, in a storytelling mode of his life and, and how, uh, largely his grandfather figured into his life. And Hector tells a story into the phone of uh, uh, an incredible village square machete fight oh, yeah. that uh, his grandfather was involved in when trying to take, what was it, the goats to market? He was taking a, a basket of back, they would travel <coughs> up with uh, turkeys and turkeys. Wicker, wicker baskets right. slung across the back of his and world. And a, a couple of bored, uh, 
show-offs, big guys on the edge of the market, essentially challenge him or, or, or tease him. Yeah. And, it, and a, an incredible showdown goes down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is cinematic. Where did that story come from? Did someone tell you that story, or is that out of your brain? That one came out of my brain. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I made that one up. <laughs> it's a heck of a story. But it, well, thank you. Yeah, but I, I spent a lot of time on it and thinking about it. And um, uh, but I, you know, it's, I, one of the one of the themes down there that's so powerful is. Kind of the further south you go, the darker people get, and the the, the the higher incidence of indigenous people, and obviously the you know there's hotter sun and more sun, and you know Mexico is as color and race conscious as the U.S. is. And you think, wow, they're all Mexican, but they don't see themselves that way. And so uh, you got a Spanish guy like this guy who was hassling mm -hmm. this indigenous guy, and and you know the. It's so extreme that you know if you're from Oaxaca, which is one of the poorest states in the country, and where people where where people are kind of most uh, you know uh, purely indigenous, if you will, uh, they get up north where people are much more mixed, mestizo. You know, it's, it's like Métis, the equivalent of Métis. Uh, and you get up north and they see these short, you know, very dark people coming, and they they would call them Oaxacas, and it's a slur. You know, it's not quite the N word, but it basically means you are a dark, poor, ignorant country bumpkin from the South. Mm -hmm. And it's a slur. It's actually made its way into California public schools. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's been, and I, when, that's something that really struck me, you know, especially as an enormous white person uh, being down there. And uh, that's something that I, you know, we, we don't necessarily think of, of that kind of, of racism and, and, and all the inferences that people make, you know, based on what shade of brown you are, especially in Mexico. Uh, but it was a real issue, and that, you know, was such a uh, just that wasn't the reason I wrote the scene. Just the scene was a c compelling scene to explore, but but that you know sort of a side effect of it. Uh, now I, I just want to say that um, I'm keeping an eye on my watch because we are going to try to um, allow time for some questions. So if you have any, uh, get them ready. Uh, but I have a few more. So uh, now all three of your books uh, deal to a, a certain extent, sometimes a major extent, with environmental issues. Uh, alongside the tension and the suspense and the violence and the struggle for survival, uh, you clearly have a, a, a vested interest in ecology and environmentalism. Do you consider yourself an activist? Uh, um, Gian Gameshi asked me that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> Let's see, what else do I got here? Uh, you know, I, I don't see how you can write about the world or current events without talking about the environment. I just don't, you know, it's not that I have a particular axe to grind. It's just, it, everything happens in the environment. And so to not write about it is, you know, it's, it's kind of to have a blind spot, I think. And it's also, also to miss a really fascinating and important and illuminating dimension of our experience. And, you know, there's been this oil spill out here. And, and sort of, you know, to write about Vancouver or to write about English Bay without writing about what goes on in, in, in the water is, I think, you know, irresponsible or certainly not very interesting, you know, and to, to leave that out. It's a really important part of the story. So, and, and here, you know, for example, this whole, there's this whole corn component. And I'm not really that interested in corn, to be perfectly frank, you know, I, I like to eat it. But for people in Oaxaca, they, they created corn. That's where corn comes from. Corn is now the world's most valuable crop. It came out of southern Mexico, Central America. The oldest known grains that we would call corn were found in a cave in, in Oaxaca. And GMOs are coming in. NAFTA is a strong presence in Mexico, changing the country by the day. And people are 
fighting for their lives uh, through the medium of corn. And corn is about, it's about so much more than food. It's really about sovereignty. It's about identity. It's about a connection to the land and main, maintaining that integrity. And you know, there's an analog up here on the coast, uh, too. And that's, uh, it's just part of the whole picture. Yeah, so I mean, activist. Uh, I'm not really trying to dodge that one. I, I guess we need action. We, we need to defend our home and, and value it and um, stand up for it um, because it keeps us alive. And, and I really saw that in Mexico. You know, people who have so little uh, but have this millennial connection to the land. Um, and they're standing up for it. And they have very few resources except their deep knowledge of that place and their deep connection to it. And it's uh, inspiring. And is there a solution for them? I mean, is there hope? For oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. It would be really nice if the U.S. wasn't allowed to dump millions and millions of subsidized corn into the Mexican market and completely undercut the uh, Mexican farmer, you know, who is growing corn and trying to sell corn. And when you get you know five million tons coming in at pennies, you know for pennies it disrupts the market, and it's really not. You know we would obviously we resent that too. You know and, and we've gone through some similar issues around uh, the sale of logs and things like that. So it's uh, there is a solution. It's not a simple one. Uh, I want to go back to uh, the Mexican border, the U.S. Mexican border. Uh, you're, you mentioned uh, that you're a dual citizen, uh, so is your wife. Yeah. And, uh, and, and she has family in Arizona? She does. And so you, you've spent time on that border. Uh, oh yeah, a lot. And is it true that you've actually illegally crossed it? I have, <laughs> yeah. Going the other way. On foot and by water. I swam across the Rio Grande once into Mexico. and. Uh, it's a really beautiful day, kind of like today, very remote part of the river. It was naked, sunny. It's just really a, a, a kind of a peak experience. And uh, we've done a lot of hikes along the border uh, through the desert, and so you can kind of meander across. And this is sort of pre-fence. So I've been exploring that area since the 80s. And what was it that imagery that you used? for the imagery that you paint in those yeah, scenes? Yeah, that's certainly a, a big part of it. That whole scene where Hector and his dad, when he's little, are, are swimming across the Rio Grande. You know, that's a recreation. You thought of the time?